Hi guys, and welcome back to VR Essentials, where we talk about the practical uses of virtual reality. Now today, I'm super, super excited because in episode two, season one of Meta Business Podcast, we can get to learn all the behind the scenes and the business aspect of the metaverse. We're gonna be interviewing none other than the creator and lead developer behind Walkabout, Minigolf, VR, one of the highest grossing games that you can find on Facebook, Meta, Oculus Quest 2, the Pico Neo 3 Pro, also Steam VR, and probably other places. Now you can skip to wherever you want to go by following the pinned comments or in the description below as well. And if you missed last week's interview, we spoke to Cluj Interactive who released the most, well, one of the most popular, sorry, VR fitness games called Synth Riders. And of course, guys, if you want to keep up to date with next week's video, make sure you enable the bell after you subscribe. All right, without further ado, let's roll the tape. Uh, so Lucas, thank you so much for, for being on the call today. I really, really appreciate it. And, you know, first of all, maybe you can just give us a brief introduction as to uh, who you are, what you do, and of course, uh, what was your role on Walkabout uh, Mini Golf? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so my name is Lucas Martel. I was the, or I am the, the lead dev on Walkabout Mini Golf. It was actually a 95% solo project, uh, at least up until the point where it first came out. And then over the last nine months, basically, I've added a few more members to the, to the team. So we're up to about 10 people now, basically um, doing wow. courses, doing DLC, just sort of like generally, um, yeah, just trying to get people want more courses. So we're trying to do a lot more as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. um, but as for my history, I'm actually, I come from the animation side of things. Um, so I had done a short film way back in the day called Pigeon Impossible, which was the basis for Sp uh, Spies in Disguise, which was the Blue Sky film with Will Smith and Tom Holland. So awesome. see, I come I come from a very deep animation background, and I've mm -hmm. been doing game dev for the last probably five or six years. Um, honestly, it kind of started off as one of those things where animation, you know, some of the projects, while they're very cool, um, mm -hmm. They've gotten larger and larger, and I found myself in a point where I wasn't getting to do much of the hands-on stuff anymore. Um, right. It was more writing, directing, and then sort of like, yeah, um, directing is mostly meetings. Um, and so game dev for me kind of started off as a way to get back to my roots of actually doing hands-on stuff and everything. So, um, yeah, I've done, this would be the third game. I did one called 57 Degrees North, um, another one called Laser Maser. Both of those were mobile games. And then, uh, yeah, Walkabout came up. Uh, came out a little over a year ago. Right. So, so I've been doing it for a while. But what, why specifically uh, game development uh, from, from animation? And, and what, what kind of the skill set uh, did you manage to take from your animating uh, to, to the yeah. world of uh, 3D development gaming? You know, I think that um, it's one of those things that there's a decent bit of crossover, especially on the 3D, on the art side of things, that sensibility and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of stuff that transfers over. It's also quite a bit different in terms of the skills you need, especially for doing something like, uh, like VR, especially on Quest. Um, in film, we're used to throwing, you know, you can throw a billion polygons onto the screen and yeah, as long as you have a decent enough machine or render farm, it's not, the, it's not that big of a deal. Um, right. Whereas Quest, everything has to be obscenely optimized. Um, at the same time, though, a lot of the tricks that we use, there's equivalence to it in the game world. And so I came in with a pretty good understanding of baking things and how to optimize. There's a lot of additional stuff that I kind of had to learn along the way. Um, but uh, in general, I'd say a lot of it transferred over. Um, I did get a or I was like a couple credits short of a CS minor in college. Um, mm -hmm. So I... I've been coding since I was a kid. In fact, I even played around making some games when I was a kid. So right. it's, just, it's always kind of been like animation and game development were always sort of like two of my passions that were just sort of slightly different, you know, different incarnations of the same general thing of trying to make, trying to make computers do what you want. So did you have to learn from scratch some of the coding languages or did you... Uh, would you able to transpire everything? How, 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 well, yeah, you know, how did I you mean, surmount that? Um, I mean, the language stuff has never been that big of an issue just because, I mean, I started off when I was probably like seven or eight writing something and uh, basically started programming on a Commodore 64. Um, right. And then uh, up to QBasic, I spent a lot of years making, like trying to make as a, as a, pretty young kid, you know, 10 or 11, trying to make um, games in QBasic and just learning the, the concepts behind things. And then, right. so the coding side of things is actually kind of one of the areas where I'm more comfortable. Um, 
where it gets harder for me is once you start going beyond like unity is which we're using for walkabout is great because it does sort of like it provides that infrastructure and that baseline that you don't have to sort of invent the engine yourself right um, at the same time there's a lot more time there's less time spent coding and trying to learn what the engine or the various SDKs and APIs are doing sort of under the hood because um, once you're trying to tap into something like the Oculus SDK, you really need to understand what the order of operations is and just how stuff is is happening at a deeper level. Um, yeah. What, 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 what made you want to choose specifically Unity? Was it the, uh, the ease of use, the, the kind of feel and mood the graphics provide? I mean, why not go with mm -hmm. something like Unreal and, and explore what that engine could have provided you? Well, well, I mean, a lot of it is also just because all of the games we've done in Unity um, and because we have done a couple games on mobile, mm -hmm. Unity just it seems to be more catered towards that. Um, I, I'd actually be kind of curious to find out what folks on the Quest, um, if there's many other Quest developers using Unreal. Um, mm -hmm. I Just everyone I know seems to be using Unity just because largely it was sort of catered more towards that. And there's some rendering optimizations that I know you can do in Unreal. Um, but um, I also started using Unity probably eight, nine years ago, probably back. It was just a whole different ball game and, you know, use what you know. And right. even though I, I, we've actually played around with Unreal for a couple of projects, actually even more on the animation side of things. So it's one of those things that I'd, I'd actually like to dip my toe into deeper, but If you're starting a new project that, you know, I, I like to make the stuff, not necessarily just learn new software for the sake of learning new software. So, um, and it takes a lot of years of using any piece of software to really get to that point where you know the ins and outs and you know where stuff is at and some of the, every engine has its quirks. So, right. I, I guess the only one that I can think of in terms of a uh, very simple kind of platform or the simplest platform would have to be Tetris effects. Mm -hmm. uh, which is used the Unreal Engine, and it's a very simple platform. It's, it's not like Assassin's Creed and all these kind of things. Right, um, yeah. So I guess, I guess it, they, I mean, if you were curious, you know, that would be a platform to, okay. to check out and see how they utilized it. Oh, um, yeah, one, one, that using, one on Quest that was using Unreal. I see what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, so when, when you had to learn new stuff, what did you do? Did you just take time off and go back and to school, so to speak? Or did you learn on the job? How, how did you manage to, um, to deal with these of, kind of challenges? Sort of learned on the job. So there's actually another game that I had started off with that was kind of my internal passion project through our studio, Mighty Coconut. Mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of something that I was doing in the cracks. And yeah, I was doing it in the evenings and stuff as kind of a way of just messing around and learning stuff. Um, I had also been doing it off and on kind of as a hobby thing for, for several years. So again, it's, it took probably three or four years of just sort of playing with it before I started using it more seriously. Um, and then the first game that we did, 57 North, was for the Merge Cube, um, mm -hmm. which if you know it, it's sort of, it's a just a foam cube that has basically tracking markers on it, but you could do some really interesting stuff with it. Um, mm -hmm. And so we did a branching narrative game with that. Um, that was kind of layered. So if you're looking at it through your phone, um, you actually see all of the, basically you can turn the cube and it actually has depth, almost sort of like you're looking into a shadow box sort of thing. Um, right. That was, uh, so we Merge actually, um, we had talked to them and, you know, we had played around with it enough and, and helped deliver a couple of projects that they felt confident enough, basically having, you know, um, supporting us and making that. Um, And that worked out very well for us as an animation studio because the way that we went about it was very much like you would an animation project. The coding on it, you know, to get, you know, other than using their SDK to sort of activate different things, mm -hmm. there was very, very little that needed to be done from a technical standpoint. Um, the bulk of that one was way more about the art assets, which were right. all 2D hand painted. And that was something where, you wow. know, we had a handful of 2D artists. So we, set nice. it up in shotgun with, I think we had like 150 different layered images. Uh, and we just treated it like you would an animated project, just sort of like, okay, we've done, you know, we did an animated series that had 2,500 fully animated CG shots. So, wow. nice. so that's sort of like, you know, that's a big render farm. <laughs> yeah. Although everything's got GPU rendering. So we've been using Redshift from the animation side of things. So yeah, I think right. we had at the time we probably had probably 30, 1070s, which would have been sort of the 
at the time that would have been the state of the art. Um, right. But, uh, but yeah, using Redshift and all that to, to crank out frames and stuff like it's, it's gotten so, so much easier, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's just kind of one of those things where once you have a pipeline and all that sort of thing. So we, we come at it from the opposite side, whereas a lot of game people might not feel as comfortable doing like massive amount of art assets. We're just sort of like, Oh no, that's the part that we know how to do. We know how to build the pipeline right. around that. So. That's really awesome. How did you guys end up, you know, working on these really cool shows with all these people that like you mentioned, Will Smith and stuff and with Fox. Yeah. How, how do you manage to land this stuff? I mean, so, so Pigeon Impossible was a, it's a short film that I did. I, I had some help on that, but I probably did about 80% of it. It mm -hmm. took me about five years and that wow. was sort of the first, um, I was very lucky on that side of things because it was right in that batch of sort of the first kind of indie animated films that to a casual observer looks, you know, almost like a Pixar uh, movie does. So it right. was just right at that time where it had just become possible on a home workstation, basically to make something like that. Um, so that was a path that, I mean, literally it was just like riding that wave sort of like, Oh, here's a, here's a thing. It's just now becoming possible. We did it. And then, the the market was wide open so i was able to get you know a manager and agent off of that uh pitched the film uh to a couple of production companies brought them on board took it straight into fox and basically set that up that was 2009 um and then it took 10 years to actually get the film made wow um, so which is pretty par for the course and the fact that it got made at all was largely just luck mm -hmm. um just because yeah, it happened to have the right, you know, the right elements at the right time. And, you know, a lot of those studio projects um, die before they ever see the light of day. And we just happened to get very, very lucky on that front. So, yeah, I think it's a combination of luck, right place, right time. And the fact that it was, like I said, one of those very, very early on projects when there wasn't much else like that. And the fact that it was a fairly mainstream four quadrant idea helped a lot. Right. And are you by, by nature, someone who's, very ambitious and who tries to uh, f fly to Mars, land on the moon kind of thing? Or are you generally just happy to be working on something that excites you uh, no matter how, where it would, it would go? I mean, I think, I think both to some extent. Um, I think where I have found over the years that my sort of like my sweet spot is that I really like doing ambitious projects but with a smaller scale, you know, I'm not trying to be James Cameron or someone spending, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on a project. I feel much more comfortable in that. So like, let's get a small team of really, really, you know, um, awesome people. And let's make something very cool that doesn't seem like a, you know, a team of three or four people could possibly make it. But, right. but, but yeah, so that's sort of where I find that my sort of sweet spot is. So that's why kind of walkabout has become what it has is that, Oh, this is, that's my sweet spot. Like, you know, 10 to 12 people sort of like focusing on one thing, but a lot of, you know, a lot of our team is, is just rock stars. Um, and that, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the sort of project that I find myself most gravitating towards. Mm -hmm. Um, I still have a couple of bigger ones and I still, you know, pitch shows and, and movies and all that sort of stuff. But, um, uh, I also tend to find that I like making stuff more than I like, spending a ton of time because in the, in the film world, 90% of your time is spent trying to get the thumbs up and the green light to get it made. It always feels like you're just on the verge of being canceled. I feel much more confident when it's a project that's like, Oh no, we're going to make it. And we have the resources to do it. Right. And did my coconut come about when you started to do game development or was it already uh, put together when you were doing the animation stuff? Yeah, so we started, it would have been 2014. So it was right on the heels of another short film that I did called The Ocean Maker. Okay. Um, all the stuff is on our website. Um, but yeah, so I had done The Ocean Maker with a small team of eight. We actually ended up, um, I kind of bribed all of the animation folks to work on that by, I moved the production to this little island off the coast of Belize. And we, basically, right. we basically went down there for, there were eight of us for about seven weeks. And mm -hmm. we we didn't render everything while we were there, but we pretty much came back with the film like 95% finished just in that sort of like, it was kind of like animation camp almost. Um, and yeah, and a couple of those folks who were on that have, they came on with Mighty Coconut and a couple of them are working on Walkabout Mini Golf right now. So 
Uh, where, 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 where did the name Mighty Kodak come from? It, because it's, we kind of wanted something beachy and something that kind of hit that sort of Caribbean vibe because right. essentially that was where the studio was started was actually kind of in Belize. So, um, but yeah, but then once we had that film uh, finished or close to finish, we realized, oh, we kind of want to keep the band together to, you know, to what extent we can. So we started Mighty Coconut at that point. Um, how did you guys decide to go, okay, let's do something about mini golf? So once again, sort of right place, right time, largely kind of an accident. Um, so the second game we made called Laser Maser. Um, it's a game where you actually, well, here, I'll grab my phone. You actually play it by physically walking around in your real world, like ducking around obstacles and stuff. So we're okay. using the AR, AR kit or AR core on an Android device. Um, basically, it's like your sixth off tracker and you're just looking through the phone as you as you kind of walk through these mazes. So right. um, that game was super fun. We were so proud of it. And it actually won an award at Indicate Europe. Um, it, it did very well critically and just totally tanked um, from a, just from a, from a financial standpoint. Um, right. And one of the things that we realized was that that idea of using a phone to do all this was just so new and different that people couldn't quite, it was one too many things. So like, okay, so you're using the phone to do this, but then it's also sort of like this maze thing and you're avoiding, like, it was one of those things that it was just a, a few too many new things for people to wrap their heads around. Right. Um, and so after that, we're like, well, we've got this technology. What would be something that would be a little bit more accessible? Um, oh, and the second thing about that was that because it was it was way better for people to actually play outside and people felt self-conscious physically walking around. Right. <laughs> um, it was actually awesome at NDK Europe because they did it at uh, 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 Le Canam. Um, in Paris, but they had a, it's basically a, 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 they have a huge courtyard. And so we had right. tons of people just like entirely spread out around the courtyard, just like literally like walking through the middle of people's conversations because they're, you know, they're in their own little virtual world. <laughs> um, but, uh, but anyways, so we were thinking like, okay, what could we do that would be a little bit more accessible, a little easier to wrap your head around. Um, but also something that wouldn't make people feel so self-conscious that they didn't need the physical space. Um, so we actually started, uh, we actually had the, the mini golf game as just sort of like a prototype that was started off on uh, just on phone. Um, mm -hmm. And then when the Quest came out, I was like, oh, wait a second, we're already on mobile. We're already optimized for so many of the things that I'm going to deal with. I just kind of did it. And then the next time I went out to Indicate, I showed it to Oculus and they were like, yes, do that. And so then I spent the next basically year sort of getting it ready and actually releasing it. Um, so, so you, yeah, you showed them a you, you showed them. You showed them a concept, or you showed them. Uh, Actually, a fine. Uh, I, I got it working on the Quest One. I basically okay. just were like, "Oh, let's just see how you know how easy this is to develop for." And I, you know, it didn't take too long to sort of um, port it over to mm -hmm. to it at that point, or to the Quest at that point. And then I did spend probably two or three weeks just sort of optimizing it because to get it to run at frame rate on Quest One is quite the quite the engineering feat. Mm -hmm. Um, so I spent a decent bit of time with that. And then literally I was, yeah, while I was there, I, I showed it to a couple of the Oculus folks. And at that point there was only the quest one and they were really looking for content. It was a difficult, I mean, it still is a somewhat difficult platform to develop for, but at the time I, I had the sense that sort of like, this is where VR is going. And I didn't know that it was going to get there. Like, so we released actually two weeks before the quest two came out and we didn't even know that that was about to drop um, until literally like a week before our release date. And they're like, Oh, by the way, we just announced this. We've got another headset coming out. Um, we'll send you one for testing because you should be sure to support it. And then the quest two just right. blew up. So very much there's jumping back to your original question. There's some, there seems to be a lot of sort of like right place, right time. But yeah, I do sort of like being on that, cutting edge. And I think a lot of it just comes down to that. I have a lot of projects in mind that I want mm -hmm. to do. And sometimes it's just a matter of finding the, the right, the right device or the right technology becomes available that makes it something that I can do either solo or with a small team of people, as opposed to needing a massive development studio. Uh, so you mentioned that you're working with uh, Oculus. It sounds like you're working quite closely with them. Um, what, what's it like to to work with the folks at Facebook? I have to say Facebook because Oculus is right. Uh, Facebook is the actual company. So what what, right. what is it like to work with them? What kind of support do they bring you, or feedback, or I don't know? Just give yeah. us some insights as to what it's like. 
I mean, so um, without breaking NDAs and stuff, like um, the, of course. the Oculus team over there pretty much runs independently of the rest of, of Facebook. Um, so it so really that's Facebook, still, Facebook Reality Labs, is that right? In fact, I don't even know exactly what, because okay. yeah, so, uh, but basically it's sort of like, it's frankly, it's a lot more like working with any other console, uh, basically like, yeah, like any other console um, that you're still going through certification. Um, yeah, in fact, that's probably the best way to put it is that, yeah, much more like a console than it is about anything else that you're just, mm -hmm. you have your dev relations person, um, you've got a tech person, and then once you release, there's an actual sort of store person that you could sort of have your, points of contact and it took mm -hmm. me a little while to understand that side of things that's that's one area where i would you would think that sort of like oh you've done some business or done some animation projects and stuff like that that like oh you know how it works but the way that the games world works is like completely different it operates by its own set of rules and even the right. you know a lot of the you know in the in the film world where you stay you know you've got your you got your uh, development person, you've got an exec at the studio, you've got a handful of people and it totally does not sort of like, there is no one-to-one -one relationship with any of that. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I mean, as far as the, the actual support, I mean, it was one of those things where I've been working much more closely with them sort of as we got up to the point of launch. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, it was mainly just sort of, I showed it to them and they're like, yes, do it and let us know. And so they would check in every couple of months, be like, Hey, is it ready? I'm like, yeah, I need a little bit more time. Um, and then it wasn't really until the game was like about, you know, basically ready to go into certification that really started working more closely with them. So. Right. And uh, what, what about, uh, because you, you now have walkabout mini golf uh, on steam. What is it like to work in contrast with people from steam or from valve, or is it, uh, you don't really talk to anyone. You just upload it and then let basically, it roll on its own. Yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, I'm sure that some of the AAA folks probably have a contact person over at Steam. But, mm -hmm. I mean, the nice thing about Steam is that it is sort of this the openness. Um, the downside of Steam is that, yeah, you don't have someone sort of helping you through that. You don't, you know, they just have so many different games um, coming through all of that that you really sort of are kind of more on your own, basically, to, to figure it out. Um, it's also a totally different, there are, say, there's, say what you will about sort of like the walled garden approach. I mean, Apple is sort of the same way, just in the sense of sort of like that, you know, here is our device and here's how it mm -hmm. works and here's the OS and everything is sort of a very closed ecosystem. Um, while that can be, so a lot of people don't like that, especially on the consumer side of things. As a mm -hmm. developer, it makes things like 10 times easier to develop for because you're not having to think of like, oh, what happens if this G2 user happens to have a 970 instead right. of the 10, you know, a 1070 or something. Just, there are so many weird hardware combinations and so many people who are, who have set their own settings set up in a, in a very different way than you could ever sort of possibly test for. So. Right. And what, what are some of the things you've had to do for Seam to make sure that uh, it can work on cross platforms from HTC to Valve to HP Reverb or, or different cards, you know, all, all this kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, less of it on the direct side of things. I think mm -hmm. that the bigger thing, so I actually brought on a couple of people to help with the Steam port. Um, Farbridge is the name of the studio, it's a friend of mine's studio. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked with them um, on a handful of projects throughout the years. So, they handled the the Steam port directly, but I will say that I think the the biggest challenge on Steam at the moment it's specifically sort of a Steam Unity thing because everyone's sort of like, oh, OpenXR is where everything's going. Right. However, the OpenXR integration isn't actually ready for prime time yet, and yes. because everyone's ready, everyone's like, oh, OpenXR is going to solve all these problems. They kind of right. stop developing all those other ones, so we're in a weird in between state where, in a year from now, VR Dev is going to be awesome. But right now we're at this weird sort of like where the new stuff isn't working yet and the old stuff has been EOL for a year or even more in some cases. So right. there's just a whole lot of that sort of that sort of stuff. Um, it's also complicated a little bit more by the fact that because we're doing a lot of updates and we are mm -hmm. we're going to be re releasing a lot more content, we need everything to live together in the same project. So we had to go up to unity 2020 for a variety of reasons but 
Steam would have been way happier to be back at 2019. So you kind of, you have to sort of like find that, that you can't just sort of go with the ideal solution for each platform because you need it all to live in a single project and, and yeah, play nice with each other, which uh, the, the VR platforms definitely do not play nice with each other at the moment. Right. Hence open XR, which we all hope. It'll be, it's going to be great when it's ready. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so what about cloud computing? Now we have, uh, at the moment, we, we have Valve who released the Steam Deck, right? Mm -hmm. Personally, I was, what I was excited about was the fact that even though it's not VR ready at the moment, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, if it does well, which hopefully it does, then obviously they would come up with a new device. Mm -hmm. And then logically speaking, that device would be compatible with the next Valve, which they're planning to release. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know when exactly. It could be next year or in two years. But it's yeah. supposed to be a wireless device, uh, regardless what it's like. So... How, well, how does the cloud computing excite you in terms of getting, you know, walkabout mini golf and other future projects in the future, uh, you know, in the future uh, to get more distribution. So more people get to, to try it. Um, well, I guess that'd probably be a different thing. So like cloud computing versus steam deck would be to like two very, very kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. It feels like, because, and this is, I haven't really done too much research in it, but my understanding is steam deck is essentially sort of a, it's essentially sort of like a laptop, but put into a, a form factor that is almost more like a switch is kind of my understanding of it. A portable PC kind of thing. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. But it's not actually doing sort of like Stadia type cloud, sort of like pulling everything in remotely. Is it? Uh, to my understanding, no, it basically, it's doing uh, but it ha things locally. It ha it's doing things locally. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that, my gut says that VR, I think there's always going to be, there's still going to be a PC VR sort of like there's people going to be developing games for that. I think that VR is largely, I mean, it's already moving away pretty hard from that. I feel like it's going to be moving more and more towards standalone devices. Um, and whether that's a Steam Deck tethered to something, I don't actually know the specs on it, sort of like just how that compares in terms of like, say, yeah, I'm sure that it's got more power than uh, than like the Quest 2, but I don't know. I can't imagine that it's like a drastically different thing. So, well, I think I think what's very interesting about it is that you can basically plug in a normal display and run any Steam game. Yeah. Um, so that's amazing. But you yeah. can't plug in, uh, you know, your Pico Neo into it or, mm -hmm. or or your Quest into it using the the cable or. Or, or, or the wireless version, which yeah. I think is, is very interesting that that's lacking there. Um, it seems like they likely will fix, or it, I thought I even heard um, someone saying that, oh yeah, that they're already starting to play around with that because enough, there's been enough interest around that. Right. That likely someone will be doing that. And that's the other thing sort of like, I, I feel like a lot of folks have said, I think that VR sort of like, especially with what we're doing is sort of like, we do sort of need a bit more of a unified experience and a bit more of like a console type thing, which is like, that's kind of why Oculus is doing what they're doing at the moment with the quest. Um, but at the same time, I also feel like there's so many people now who are getting quests and they're like, Oh wait, I already have a gaming PC. Mm -hmm. Let me hook it up, whether it's by air link or by a virtual desktop or something. And they're mm -hmm. able to play some of those other games. So I feel like, it's not a mutually exclusive thing that especially if that feature of being able to hook up a standalone device and get the extra power of a PC, I feel like that's going to open up. It's going to open up some possibilities that weren't there before. And we just need to get more devices. Like to me, it's less about sort of what specific device it is. We just need a lot more people in VR right. in order to make it viable, especially we're sort of the lucky ones that, you know, that we have a, we have a, a game that's doing well, especially on, on Quest, which is the biggest platform, but it's still a very difficult... I know a lot of people say, oh, I want more AAA games. And the reality is there's just not enough people with the hardware to support, you know, a, even a $20 million um, production budget is... Unless you're someone like Valve or someone who can sort of like kind of throw money at it until and make something amazing, regardless of sort of like how much it costs there's only, you're only going to get the sort of like the two or three developers who are developer publishers who could even right. sort of do that. So, and also, but, I mean, you, you worked in a mobile gaming before and, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't, I mean, it, to me, to my, to, to my recollection, uh, mobile gaming on, on a phone wasn't, mm -hmm. especially on an iPhone, wasn't 
really great until things like Angry Birds came out. I mean, that mm -hmm. really put mobile gaming, to my recollection, really on the map. Perhaps there were mm -hmm. others before that. Uh, and this yeah. is very casual kind of game because I think most people in the world mm -hmm. are hardcore gamers. I mean, most people just... Yeah take the train or whatever and yeah. someone play something light. And uh. I, I will say that one of the things that's most interesting is that the number of folks that, I mean, this is, um, this is kind of just word of mouth, but we have gotten so many just emails and messages for a variety of people, um, especially older folks and people who well outside of what you consider sort of like that core gamer audience who have, gotten a quest either to play this one or that it was one of the games that sort of got them um, largely for the social aspect. There's something about being in the same physical space with someone. And yeah, like it's a really fun way to just sort of hang out with a friend or a relative or a grandparent even. So it, it does seem like that's not all that VR is by any stretch of the imagination. You can do so many different things with it, but I do feel like that's, that that social aspect and the more casual is it's tapping into an audience that hasn't been as well served by VR, especially because for so long it was, you know, you had to be a pretty powerful, you had to have a pretty powerful PC and some expensive hardware to do it. So I feel like that's, this is a brand new market that's just opening up. So for Walkabout Minigolf, how challenging was it to actually develop the multiplayer side? Um, it wasn't as difficult as I was expecting. So I had never done multiplayer before. Okay. Um, and in fact, it was something that I didn't even have it in there until Oculus was sort of like, I was like, Hey, we're almost ready to go. And they're like, you really need to add multiplayer. It's like, okay, I'll learn how to do multiplayer. So fortunately a golf game is something that is one of the easier ones. You're not having to worry as much about player lag and just a lot of the balancing things because everyone's running their own physics simulation on their own, um, on their own system. So it was relatively easy to get it going. Um, after launch, there was probably a few months in there where I kept, where we added a lot of features to it because I think the more difficult thing was finding, how do I put this? It was finding a lot of the things that frankly, no one had kind of even dealt with before because being on a, being on a quest, most people weren't playing hour long matches. They would be playing like, you know, you know, even if you hopped into something like 10, 15 minutes, is probably about the length. And even if you ended up playing with someone for an hour, it was different rounds. Whereas we literally had people playing hour and a half games. If you had five people in a room on a difficult course. So there was a lot of times where people were just like, Oh, they just took off their headset to go to the bathroom and it would disconnect them. So we had to add a lot of ways to help people reconnect and to let people join games in progress. And it's a lot of that, like once you, once you sort of know the problem, it's not that difficult to actually implement the solution. Um, it's just figuring out what those, what the problems are to begin with. And it was sort of, yeah, it was just kind of a weird spot where like no one, like to my knowledge, not many people have, have sort of had to deal with that. It's sort of like what happens when people, yeah, when you've got a multiplayer game and someone just takes off the headset for 10 minutes mm -hmm. and goes, gets a drink. So little things like that, that, that proved to be an interesting sort of user case to account for. It's a lot of the coding uh, that you implement in VR, very similar to a traditional 3D or 2D uh, game using Unity. Yeah, it's it's virtually identical to uh, as far as the coding side of things, other than getting your input from that. Um, mm -hmm. Really, the bigger difference would be on the design side of things and really designing for VR and um, thinking a lot about interactions. I think the one other challenge that we we have, especially because um, golf is very much a one controller game where you typically will just hold to, hold the controller with um, uh, two hands. Mm -hmm. um, designing for that has been a bit of a challenge just because half the number of buttons. Um, so you can't do some of the more complex interactions or yes, yeah, some of the, the multi or yeah, like two thumbsticks sort of like a uh, uh, dual controller sort of stuff. So um, there was a decent bit of that that was also sort of like, there's, I, I think that most of the golf games are doing the same thing, but it's a problem that everyone has to deal with when they're kind of going against the grain with something like that. Right. And uh, I mean, I also imagine, how do you manage to get, because you wanted to get it to a certain extent as close as possible to the real thing, right? So mm -hmm. when people are under the headset, they feel mm -hmm. like they're on the course, they feel like they're actually playing mini golf. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, how how tough is it to get the ball to respond in a specific way when it's hitting uh, or colliding with, you know, uh, uh, I mean, when you're hitting the ball to get it yeah. to re-respond, uh, spin in a way or mm -hmm. stop in a certain way or I don't know, the feel with the, gr the virtual grass, all this, how, how tough is it to get all those pieces together? Uh, so... I happen to have done a lot of physics stuff. In fact, the other game, um, it was on our website for a little while, but it was actually a, a pinball puzzler. Um, and mm -hmm. that's the game that I actually hope to come back to. It's called Bala Nova. Um, okay. I hope to come back to that maybe in another six months once the rest, once the team is fully up to speed and we're, and we're, uh, we're cranking on that. I might, I'd love to dip my toe back into that because it's one of those things that it's like, it's only like six months away from completely finished. Um, right. It just got abandoned for, you know, for life reasons. Um, so I had actually wrote the physics engine of that um, myself. And having done that and learned the ins and outs, I already sort of had a bag of tricks and knew what to kind of run into. So that kind of proved to be a bit of the, um, basically I was able to kind of work out all the problems. So when it came time to this one, it wasn't, as difficult, but it was largely just because we had already spent a lot of time solving a lot of those problems and, um, and dealing with some of that. So yeah, it's not as it's, it's not easy, but it's also the only thing that is physical and that is moving around is basically the, the single ball. And then we do have some obstacles that spin and of course your putter. Um, but it's a relatively small set. You're not having to deal with balls colliding. Um, actually, I guess we do actually have that in the menu, but but in general, sort of like sphere collisions and all that sort of stuff aren't nearly as complicated as a lot of other physics that game the game folks have to deal with. Well, what were the most important attributes to the game when you first conceived it and then started off to producing it mm -hmm. uh, to you that that you know what 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 are the core things, the core values, or the core mm -hmm. items that you wanted from the game uh, without going too crazy because I know it's a very creative kind of uh, production. Yeah. I mean, I think that probably the, the biggest thing that, that people notice the most is that we, we really want to, there's a lot of games like this where they'll sort of like, Oh, it's sort of like, here's a hole. And then you'll just go into a void and like, here's a different hole. And I, I felt that one of the things that's kind of fun about mini golf is the fact that you're on a course and you can see, Oh, I'm going to come up to that hole you know, in a, you know, in a little bit, or that you see a, a place up at the top of the cliff that uh, eventually, you know, that you're going to get up there. Um, and so I think that one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing was sort of like, it's not just the holes, it's the entire environment around you and making sure that everything connects and is actually walkable, just like a real course. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is probably the, the biggest thing that we spend a lot of time on, um, that, uh, that, yeah, that, that kind of defines what the, what the game is as opposed to many other golf games. What were some of the thrills that you would want or would you, you, you would want to see in, uh, in the game that you feel are a nice to have, but not, not a must have? Um, you mean things that we've already done or things that we're hoping to add in there? Well, things that you wish, you know, uh, because you, you must have had such a huge list of things that you would have loved to just throw into the game, but you're like, mm -hmm. well, we can do this later. We can do that later because yeah. it's not a must have. It's, it's a nice to have. I mean, so on our discord, we have sort of a kind of a roadmap. It's more, but it's more of a, just like, here's a list of things that like people have recommended and like, yes, we're going to get to them at some point. Um, we've kind of been, we haven't updated a few of the more, re I mean, the, the more recent one that we added was smooth locomotion. Um, mm -hmm. The flying ability was actually something that that was never part of the design. And then as we were testing out the smooth locomotion, one of, um, one of our course designers found a way that they could sort of like glitch off the map, like, but it's kind of nice to be able to go here to this place. And so then we just implemented flying properly. Um, and that turned out to be a huge hit that was never sort of like, yeah, just one of those happy accidents. Um, but yeah, we're, we're wanting to do a lot more with different, um, uh, different course modes. Um, race mode is something that a lot of people have asked for. Um, also just a handful of quality of life stuff in terms of, um, how you're managing. Like I know right now, if you are in a, if you've got two people in the same room playing against someone mm -hmm. else remotely, we need just some basic stuff to be able to like, Oh, push to talk or mute, you know, there's a handful of things like that that are just basic quality of life things. But our list of those is so long that it's sort of like we're getting like, we're slowly chipping away at everything, but we do have 
quite literally a mountain of, of, of things that are on our list. So we're just kind of getting them in order of priority, but also when it makes sense. Like when you redo one part of the system, it makes sense to also fix, you know, if you're ripping out the kitchen or if you're ripping out the sink, fix up the whole kitchen at the same time, basically while you're making a mess of it. So, um, but yeah, so no, there's a, there's a lot of those. And luckily we're in a boat where, because we are a very actively developing game, we've released three courses. We do have another one that's going to be dropping here before too long. And then DLC after that. Um, so it means that we kind of get to keep coming back and we get to keep hitting a lot of those requests that people have had, or just things that are on our personal wish list that would be cool. Okay. So take us through, uh, what, what, how, how do you go about designing your map? So think first you'll go to the pub and have a beer and brainstorm. How, mm-hmm. how, how did the maps come into fruition? Well, so we actually just did, so we're a hundred percent virtual studio, but a week ago or two weeks ago now, we just did, um, so virtual our beer. first, yeah, well, we, we actually did an in-person, uh, like an offsite. We actually did sort of a company retreat where we hatched the next sort of seven courses that we're going to be working on. Um, we kind of knew, but it was sort of like, oh, prioritizing and like, okay, here's the release date that at least we're aiming for. We haven't announced anything yet because with a team of our size, if one person is out for any stretch of time, like it can push back release dates and all that sort of thing. So, um, so we, we spend a lot of time. I mean, for us, it's always a balance of sort of like, what is the, what is the theme of the course, especially in mini golf? That's, that's super important. What's something that's different than a lot of the other things that we have done. Um, we always like to kind of like keep it fresh and try to, we're starting to push quite a ways beyond sort of like what people would think of like traditional mini golf. And now we're getting into just like, what would be the coolest place you can think of to put a mini golf course. And now we're starting to do that, which is a lot of fun. Um, and then, so it usually starts off with, uh, with that sort of general sort of like what it is. And we usually come up with some basic design things like here's the shape language. Here's the type of gameplay. Um, for instance, one of the things that we do a lot of is, um, we think about just even like what are the materials that they're going that a course like this would be made out of. So for instance, right. Seagull stacks, which is sort of on these like um, Celtic sort of like sea stacks, it's all rock. There's no wood. And all of the barriers of the holes consist of um, they're very curvy organic shapes, but they're basically the borders are all created by placing rocks along those borders, which gives it a very irregular feel and, you can bounce off those rocks, but there's also the risk of like, if you hit a crevice in the wrong way, you can go shooting off the opposite way you expect it to versus something like cherry blossom, um, which was designed more out of like um, sort of Zen garden, like very, Mm -hmm. very flat, perfect angles that you can predict how the ball is going to bounce off of those um, in a much more predictable way. So we think a lot about that. um, And sometimes that defines the play. We're also starting to get into a few more, actually introducing some new mechanics um, very slowly, but yeah, kind of coming up with some interesting things that again, sort of take mini golf beyond sort of what people typically think of it as, but it's Mm -hmm. still very accessible, very fun. Um, I guess I'm kind of, but you were asking about the actual course creation part of it then. So typically we've been using gravity sketch a lot, um, which is a 3d, basically it's like a VR sketching tool. Mm -hmm. Um, But the great thing about that is that we can go in and in VR, we can actually sort of like start, we usually start with just line wire work, just like roughly sketching out the shape, like where's the path of the holes going to be at. And you can do it very, very quickly. Um, It's also very nice to do it that way because you can start to picture like, oh, what is the height as opposed to just doing like a top down map or something like that. Right. Um, move stuff around very, very quickly and just generally sort of get a rough like shape and start putting down the sort of temp holes. Um, and then we go through and we actually really start to like, okay, now that we know the rough shape, let's actually start to try to make it real. So we come up with the actual hole designs. We come up with um, a lot of times we'll nudge things around to make it just visually more appealing. We always try to design in a couple of some, you might call them wow moments. Not every course has them quite the same way, but like on Taurus trap behind me here, there's the mm-hmm. moment where you never even see the back nine of the, of the course until you come out of the cave. And suddenly there's this whole other part of the map that you've mainly just, maybe you've seen a couple of palm tree tops back there, but you've never actually gotten right. to experience it. So mm-hmm. we actually kind of try to do that to hide little areas so that you, you come across them throughout the normal course of play. Um, so after you approve the art direction, that's when it goes into production or does everything get interweaved? 
I mean, everything is kind of production. Generally, what we try to do is we try to get a course fully playable. And mm -hmm. so it's basically like a gray box. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, myself, Henning, and now we've got one other person on the team kind of doing these designs and everyone has their own thing. Henning, when he does his designs, he does lighting. He like really gets it to the point where like this almost feels final. Um, right. And then a modeler comes in and actually does the more detailed work. When I'm doing stuff, it does tend to be more true gray box. Like it's just blocks and spheres mm -hmm. and sort of like, okay, I know there's columns here, there's walls here. Um, and then we let our concept artist sort of like do a draw over and kind of define what the space is going to be. But still before it goes into that modeling, it's fully playable. So you can actually play all 18 holes and walk through the course. So it's well laid out and you know exactly what, what the course is gonna be. It just hasn't, it doesn't look pretty yet. Uh, you mentioned that you work remotely. So how do you manage to, to get everybody, keep them motivated and, you know, get all the information across and, and, you know, doing this remotely because it can't be easy. Um, it definitely, you lose some stuff by working remotely. Um, this game actually is probably one of the better ones for doing it this way, largely because each course takes about like three weeks, three to four weeks through each step of the process. So the designer will basically be working out the gray box like I was just talking about for, yeah, probably about three weeks. And by the end of the three weeks, they probably have like a playable version of it. Um, then the modeler comes in, does their thing, and then we get into lighting and optimization and finaling and everything. So right. there's a few there's a few other things in there as well. But in general, it's sort of like it's you could just do sort of like a weekly check in as opposed mm -hmm. to for us coming from the animation world, it's not uncommon to have someone working on, oh, they're working on a shot and oh, this shot's only going to take like, especially for TV animation, it's going to take like three hours. And so you need to give them like 10 shots and constantly checking in that sort of stuff. So right. luckily that, um, that sort of helps. The other, the thing that is actually the best for us is, well, Gravity Sketch, we're using some of their co-spaces so we can actually all hop into the same Gravity Sketch together. Um, and actually be drawing on stuff and like pointing at stuff. Um, we do the same thing with the courses too, because we can actually all hop into a course and it's almost like being in the same room with them that, you know, we can point out stuff like, Oh, Hey, I found a little bug here. I found this little crack that lets the ball fall through or a variety of other things that you can actually mm -hmm. just, you have those conversations right on the course. So right. that's very um, helpful. Yeah. So, I mean, VR in particular, actually VR multiplayer in particular, it makes that, actually work surprisingly well. And uh, now, I, I, I mean, you, you've been in the business for quite a while, so I wouldn't say you guys are an indie dev because you're a proper studio. Uh, what are some of the things that you think, uh, let's just, you know, think like sliding doors, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. movie. Um, if you're an indie developer, how do you think this project, would, I mean, how would you have started this project compared to uh, how you actually did it because you, you did it in, in uh, not so much as an indie development, but more of a, of a studio. How different I mean, do you think it would have been? I think, I mean, I actually, this was very much an indie development because okay. we've been doing animation for a long time. And this was basically sort of, again, I had one person helping out a little bit on some of the actual modeling stuff, but mm -hmm. again, it was like 90% just me as a solo dev. Right. I did that. And so the actual release of the project, I did completely independently of, um, you know, it was nights and weekends and it was kind of my COVID project while we were in lockdown that I was sort of like, right. hey, I need something to focus on. So that was largely what, how I was sort of like dealing with the situation was by not dealing with it and just going into my little VR world. Um, right. So, uh, so no, so, I mean, this was actually done very, very much like an indie project. I mean, now, yes, we are treating it more as sort of like a, a studio, but I mean, it depends on your definition of that. Like we're still very much mm -hmm. an indie studio, but it's just grown to have a, a handful of folks. So, so maybe, yeah. So I guess that was more sort of, um, yeah. What the, what was the question again, specifically? Well, no, I'll, t I'll just say it's another question because you kind of, uh, you kind of answered it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I think what's interesting also is did you, when you started this thing, uh, because you just mentioned you, you started, if, started it on your own, did you think about monet monetization and all this kind of stuff before you did it? Or because a lot of indie devs I talk to don't really think about how they're going to make money from the game. They just want to make mm -hmm. something that makes sense yeah. uh, and that's fun for them to do. But mm -hmm. what was your mindset when you started this thing? I mean, I think it's a balance. Like it was definitely not done sort of like as a, as a money thing and like the monetization thing, we're not doing 
right at least right now we do have DLC coming out here before too long, but right now it's sort of like it's a one time sort of premium premium game. So I didn't think too much about that side of things, but at the same time, I did want something that I could justify. I've got a wife and kids and you know all that sort of stuff. So like I did want something that would at least hopefully pay off the amount of time that I was putting into it um, in an ideal world. But we've had a couple of, we, basically our other two games did not do that. So I did not expect it to be nearly as successful as this has been. Um, but I would also say that there was a little bit of thought in that just because sort of like, oh, mini golf just seems like, not from a money standpoint, but strictly from a sort of sense that like a, an audience standpoint, like they're like, I want a really, really awesome mini golf game. Other people want it. All, virtually everyone loves mini golf. And it just, so like there were, there were, there were definitely some, some thoughts along that, but I think it was more about sort of like thinking what the audience wants versus straight, just sort of like, how are we going to make money off this thing? So. And so when, when you started the project now, obviously it was self-funded by yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, but then did you, did you go out and try to seek funding? Uh, if so, how do you manage to, to find the funding to expand the team? Um, yes, yeah, no. So at the moment now we've basically, uh, it's all sort of self-funding. I have other than the, you know, other than setting up, uh, basically projects within the sort of like the LA system for film stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I guess there was sort of like the one project, a film project that I brought on a, a private investor for. It's something that I have not had great luck with. And it seems like a lot of times you end up spending more effort going after that or trying to find that person mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just making it. So I think that a lot of it comes down to more like, I mean, this is the thing that I would recommend probably to a lot of other indie devs or people trying to do it is sort of like try to set the scope something that you can do that does not require that. Um, this right. was the sort of thing that like, if this had just been sort of like, Oh, those four courses, or, you know, maybe we wouldn't have done an extra course or two. It would have been, you know, I still would have been super happy with it. Um, it's only been because we like, it's done well enough that, that now sort of like the, the team is sort of like the, the game is actually funding the team. So the more people buy it, the more, you know, the more courses that we're able to put into production. And we're hoping that the DLC, like that's another thing that's sort of like, we don't need the DLC to make money. We just need it to break even so that we can keep the team on and keep doing more and more courses. So. And do you think this is where Facebook comes in? Because, uh, I mean, obviously we're still at a stage where things are kind of still new in VR. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of flexibility from various different uh, marketing uh, distributors or hardware manufacturers mm -hmm. to try and get more content and not just uh, any content, but content that potentially has a commercial uh, viability to it. And I think, um, uh, walkabout mini golf is quite polished. I mean, you know, uh, yes, there are other applications like for example, super hot, uh, which isn't as, uh, texturally or graphically, uh, mm -hmm. lavish, but it does what it set out to do, which is why it was also, uh, successful in its own right. Mm -hmm. And then you have walkabout mini golf, which is more polished, but also at the same time it works and it does what it's uh, set out to do too. So, uh, do you find that indie devs, because you just mentioned it can be quite tough to go out and seek funding, which I think is the problem for 99.9% .9 of, of people. Yeah. Uh, so do you think like platforms like Facebook that come around provide that ease, uh, not really think so much about funding where you, if you mm -hmm. just know how to code, you got a few friends, uh, you put something together that makes sense and is playable and fun, uh, yeah. then you can just pitch it to, to, to people like Facebook or whatever to, just get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, yeah, so, I mean, I don't know if I can say, but basically, yeah. So Facebook didn't actually fund anything with this one. I think that. I mean, the ease maybe, of being able to get something out as yeah. opposed to trying to put it on a mobile app. I mean, it's impossible. Yeah. There are millions of. I, I think that what I would say with that is sort of like, especially for indies, sort of like, it's very difficult to sort of know the market until you've released a game or two. So the first, so 57 North, um, we did that. It's like a, it's a little over an hour. It's fully narrated with all that. We actually did that project in less than two months. Um, and it, again, it was largely because we had a, we had a, you know, we had five or six people on it that were basically, they were rolling off of an animation project. We had a window. So like, okay, let's do this and, and, and get it done. Um, but, uh, 
But that was very, so, I mean, ironically, that one actually had way more people behind it than walkabout, um, at least at the time that we were, we were doing the development on it. But um, that one did okay. Actually, the thing that was kind of interesting about that one is because of the merge cube is that there were a lot of folks who got the merge cube, but there weren't a ton of apps available for it, especially at the time. Um, and so when people were talking about the merge cube, we naturally came up in the conversation. I think that's sort of where we happen to get lucky and land with this, where a lot of folks, if they're getting a quest, you know, they're likely at least aware of walkabout, which is, a, you know, again, that's largely just luck at the time that we happen to, to launch. Um, so I think that one thing that would be a really good sort of recommendation for um, indies is to focus on sort of like that cutting edge stuff or something new and something original that the AAA studios aren't going to be able to do because it just takes them so long or they're not in a position where they're able to take risks. So coming up with what that hook is, like whether it's a gameplay thing or whether it is the actual the device that you're aiming for, um, mm -hmm. those things can help dramatically. Because if you're just trying to do just any mobile game, mobile is a absolute nightmare to try to make money on unless... Right you have that sort of like that one killer thing, you know, unless you become Monument Valley basically, and you do something so cool and so original that it just, it becomes its own own little thing. And even then, especially on mobile, you still have to have a lot of know-how and marketing savvy. And that's, I think, an area where a lot of um, indies have a hard time just because it's difficult to get that, it's difficult to get that message out there. Exactly. I wanted to ask you, uh, have you thought about or are you uh, working with Pico Interactive or even trying to get your app on the Vive Focus 3? Because I know that HTC mm -hmm. are trying to build more content for enterprise uh, so that when the professionals using their, the businesses using their headsets can also mm -hmm. offer something a bit more casual to, uh, to the users there. Yeah. I, so I guess... We're talking to a handful of folks, so I can't, because there's all sorts of NDAs with that, I can't really say specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but our goal is to support as many platforms as makes sense, basically. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, we're on Steam now. We're talking about a couple of other, a uh, couple of those. We also have, we still have the AR, uh, the iOS and Android version of the app that's, it basically is almost done. Um, that's actually been a couple of other thing reasons that we haven't just totally put the finishing touches on that, but that one's full cross play um, with the VR. So you can actually have, you know, if you've only got one VR headset in the house, but everyone has a phone, mm -hmm. everyone can still be playing together, um, which is nice. Um, so we're kind of going in order of priority just in terms of like, you know, who has the most headsets or at least to guarantee that the time that we're spending on the ports, um, makes sense. Um, part of that is also that because again, because we're a ongoing game, it's not just a question of, um, will you sell enough? But every time we come up with a new course, we need to support it. We need to do like, there are constant sort of updates that needs to happen. And so every time you add a platform to that, um, it's not just a straight port that, that then you just do it and you're done. You have to continue supporting that for years to come. So I think that's something that every VR developer is dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, such a small community that we, a lot of us chat, that, that is always the thing. So like everyone wants to be on platforms, but the, yeah, the, the porting and the support and making sure that sort of like that, uh, that, that it's um, able to sustain itself is always the challenge, especially with new standalone platforms. Um, just to sidetrack very quickly, uh, just circling back to OpenXR, so do, do you guys really think in the world of development that it will change things? Is this something that you guys feel is going to be widely adopted like straight away once, once it works? Or, and, and if so, is that why you guys are kind of like waiting until it takes over? Or do you, is, is the sense that, um, no, it's not something that everyone's going to jump jump on the bandwagon from from the get go. I mean, I think that I think that it is going to. I mean, right now VR development is so fragmented, and you have to do so much stuff that is a hundred percent custom just to the platform that you're doing it on. So that's at this point because we because Open XR, at least the sort of vanilla sort of like Unity implementation of it, is not quite ready for prime time. Um, I don't think that that is. 
that's that's not what's necessarily holding us back, but we're not sort of like theoretically once it works, it shouldn't be any more difficult than adding another platform. And if you happen to get three platforms out of supporting OpenXR, then great. So I do think that it's something that, I mean, every VR developer desperately wants. I don't think that it's going to necessarily change how, it's not going to change anything for the, for users and for players. Um, it's what it's is going to affect those that it's going to mean that once everyone's on OpenXR, then someone could come out with a new headset and it's not a massive amount of work to port something and do all the custom stuff and work out all that. Sort of like, it's one of those things that like, oh, hey, if that platform supports OpenXR and has the hard respects to be able to handle it, then games should just work. Um, theoretically, it never quite happens like that, but I think that's where it's going. I mean, we're, we've already gotten to that point where most PC games, like if, as long as you hit the minimum specs, mm -hmm. like, it largely takes care of it. Now, it's, it's still taken a long time to get to that point, though. Right. Um, and there's still right. issues where I've got a couple of games in my library that I can't play because I did a driver update or something. So there's mm -hmm. always going to be that to some extent, but um, right. anything that gets us closer to that is huge. Um, and uh, other than marketing distribution, uh, mm -hmm. what, what are the key aspects that you look for in a, a VR hardware manufacturer when you want to work with them? Because, you know, there are other people coming in the pipeline. There's Apple coming. Uh, mm -hmm. Netflix are going to be starting uh, to develop games for VR, which yep. who knows? Maybe it means a potential VR headset. We don't know. Yeah. Um, we, we know also that Samsung are in the game. Canon mm -hmm. is in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that they haven't released stuff yet, right, for yeah. for consumers. But we can see it coming, let's say, 5 or 10 or 15 years from now. Well, mm -hmm. what, what kind of things are you looking for from them uh, that would entice you to want to develop uh, content for their platforms other than the marketing distribution? I mean, I think that, again, sort of like we're one of those things where because we're sort of like our because we're totally independent. Um, we're happy to support whatever sort of like, yeah, makes sense. And we want to support as many of those as we can. Um, I think I remember, and this is kind of like tying it back into uh, the other question that you had. So, yeah, we've got eight, nine ish on our team right now. Um, but that's only two engineers. Most of those people are actually working on courses and new content, and that sort of thing. So it's kind of one of those things where you can't just sort of like, you know, the Steam board actually took two people probably about four or five months, again, largely because there were so many things that just didn't, you know, that didn't translate from the Oculus and that had to be either changed or rewritten or just working out bugs and all that sort of stuff. And even now, right. we just we just released a patch that hopefully took care of the last couple ones that a few people have found. Mm -hmm. um, but so it's kind of one of those things where it's it's... It's not just like you could sort of just like, oh, yeah, that platform's coming out. So you do kind of have to prioritize um, and see sort of like, oh, what's, yeah, what is the thing that's going to, that you feel most comfortable about? Again, this is where I kind of put on, I take off my developer hat and I put on my business hat of just sort of like, which, uh, yeah, which, which platform are we, yeah, going to be able to get enough marketing or that they're going to have enough headsets that will be able to support it. So but what, what, what do you think uh, from the feedback of your own team could have uh, accelerated that process uh, when you were doing things with Steam? Like if, if, if Steam could provide you more support or was there something lacking on their side or it's, it's what, what do you wish could have, could have helped more? It's largely more? what I had mentioned before with just the right. OpenXR is not ready and the old Open VR hasn't been supported in over a year. So it was just sort of right. like, we just kind of had to kludge together our own solution and even rewrite some base stuff that's sort of like you would expect that anything would be mm -hmm. done. And it, it, that's just that weird thing where like, that is sort of the price of working in a relatively new media like VR. It's just like everything is still changing so fast that you can't, you know, there's there, the tools haven't been built. And as soon as a tool gets built, I mean, like that's actually a great example of even the quest stuff. Like even though the quest is using the same Oculus, like mm -hmm. once the quest came out, everyone had to suddenly worry about a whole different set of problems in terms of optimization and, you know, they have, they've developed some tools to make that easier, but even existing VR devs suddenly had to learn a lot about mobile GPU optimization. So right. it's just a lot of that. And like you, it's VR is very much still a, it's growing so fast that as soon as like, as soon as 
you know, Steam releases an update. Well, now Unity has to update their stuff to support it. By the time they do that, then they've gone over here. And so Unity has to chase them. And so, yeah, it's, right. kind of, it's just kind of a big game of cat and mouse. And that's, and all the drivers have to follow them. And all well. the drivers have to work out. And, everyone, and whenever they do an OS update. Right. Yeah. So it's just kind of, I think that's just sort of the, the state of working in any new, in any new medium like VR. Okay. When you first started uh, Walkabout Mini Golf, now you had to host stuff on a server. Obviously, your uh, application has grown since then. And every time you add a new map, it's another God knows how many polygons and whatnot that you have to cram in there to make space for. How do you plan the server part and how do you uh, adjust the server as you add your maps in to make sure that the game is still you know, still works uh, optimally, optimally, uh, you know, with time. Um, so we're actually using a public, um, so we're photon is our sort of like, um, under the hood sort of networking thing. Again, being my first multiplayer thing, I wasn't going to try to reinvent the wheel. So, um, the great thing is that we're not actually hosting our own server. Um, and that's also something that frankly, I, most indie devs, unless there's a very specific need for you to host your own server or to roll a lot of that architecture yourself, I would strongly avoid against it. Or if you just happen to be someone who you're, that's part of your day job, or you just already know a lot about server, you know, client server architecture or something like that. Um, so yeah, so we're actually doing it on the Photon Cloud, which the great thing is sort of like, as more people come on board, there's really not a, you know, a, a limit as far as the, the server goes. And we're not even especially being in VR as well, and the number of concurrent users, we're nowhere close to saturating their, um, their servers. So um, basically it was that in itself was kind of a non-issue. Um, the optimization thing that you talked about, I mean, right now we are like, we're constantly going back in and this even happens with soft, you know, with OS updates, we have to kind of go in and like, oh, suddenly that something that was working great before now doesn't work, that some new feature has been added or something like that. So we're kind of constantly having to go back to old courses and, you know, tweak things and dial a few things in to make them run. But, uh, but, but yeah, I guess, so we're not actually, because uh, yeah, it's basically just a local, a locally stored game and everything. Um, it's really just the multiplayer and the voice aspect that even passes through the server. So, um, yeah, that's fairly straightforward. Now, yeah, I strongly recommend most indies like that use a lot of any sort of like big, um, things that you can just sort of buy your way out of and not buy your way out of because it's really not that expensive like you we would probably be spending way more on our own dedicated server than we do on a, a shared cloud server so but if there's something out there that exists don't necessarily try to invent the wheel unless you want to suddenly try selling a a new multiplayer service awesome and uh i i guess so basically uh any indie devs who want to create a game uh, can't think that once you've done something you put it out it will always constantly work. You always, it sounds to me like you always have to go back to it, always have to tweak it, maintain it mm -hmm. because things just constantly revolving and changing. Uh, the yeah. technology keeps changing. So that's one of the things you guys have to do all the time. It sounds. Yeah. I mean, and some of that is also self-inflicted again, because we are, we're very active and sort of like, as we've added people, added people to the team, folks have come in with new ideas. So like, Oh, and like suddenly techniques that we had used in the original, um, you know, the first few courses worked great at that scale. But as we do more complex courses, suddenly we need more, opt more optimization strategies that weren't available. So you end up sort of like rewriting that, but then it's sort of like, well, now that we got this whole new system, sort of like we can actually fix that thing back. So it's always a, it's always a tough game of like, you don't want to create work for yourself, but at the same time, you also want to keep the project in a state that's maintainable where you don't have 20 different systems where every course is its own unique little, little thing that requires, because then your, your code base is just massive and you're constantly like, oh, oh yeah, the reason this course doesn't work is because it's using that old thing that is no longer supported in a weird way. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, we're, we're probably worse about that than a lot of folks are just again, because we're adding so much new content compared to a lot of other games. But, uh, but yeah, it's absolutely something that anyone has to, has to deal with. Uh, I wanted to ask you a business question. Um, most entrepreneurs that I've spoken to, uh, when they come up with a new entrepreneurial concept, not necessarily a game, just any other entrepreneurial things, mm -hmm. they often think about 
exiting. That's really the strategy, which shocks me. Uh, or, or really shocked me. You know, I'm like, well, why? Yeah. I thought you wanted to try and help the world. No, no, no I just want to exit. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so in terms of walkabout mini golf, is this something that you think about or do you want to be on it for as long as possible? Or is it a project that you're looking to eventually uh, sell? Would you happy to sell it to Facebook or well, what's your, what, what's your take on, on that kind of stuff? I mean, that whole thing, like that's a very sort of like, I don't come from the tech world, at, but being in Austin, I hear a lot of that of just sort of like, yeah, that it's all about sort of, um, yeah, building something up and then, and then yeah, hitting the, hitting the money button and, and getting out of it. That's not, that's just kind of not how I'm, how I'm wired. Um, so I had like, we're planning on, on basically kind of keeping going on this as, as long as it, as, as we can make it sustainable. Um, and we also, just as a studio, we do have, I already mentioned Ballanova, another game that we'd like to get back. There's another game um, that I've already sort of like, I've got the, I have it in my head that I actually want to do. So we're hoping to make several games beyond that. And in my ideal scenario, Walkabout just kind of keeps going. And it's kind of one of those things that as we, as you add more people to a team, how do I put this? I'm very lucky because I've, done the like the peer sort of like solo dev sort of side of things but i've also run a business so i understand some of those things that that some indie devs if you've never sort of like hired employees and just dealt with that sort of stuff it's very scary the first time but as you do it more often you kind of get a better sense of what works and what doesn't just as a management side of things so um i could very much see a scenario where walkabout still is like 50% of the studio. And to be honest, it would be great if people were able to kind of hop in and out because designing a mini golf course, it's great. And you spend a month on it and you can do something cool, but then you can also dive back. And so it can either, you know, it's actually really good for something like this to get more people and fresh blood sort of like trying to do different things and pushing in different directions because that just, um, it makes it better and every course more unique. So I guess that's sort of the long way of saying like, yeah, we're, we're, we're planning on, on doing this for as long as we can, basically. So you, I mean, you, you, you released the steam version. Uh, what was the real purpose there? Um, well, I mean, largely that was one. So like, just, we were talking about before, sort of like there were a lot of people sort of like, uh, there's a lot of requests that people have had. It's like, Oh, I want feature X, Y, or Z. And one of the big ones was sort of like, when can I buy this on steam? Because I right. don't have an Oculus or don't want to buy something to the Oculus store. Um, so that Which I was guess the, it's for, it's 40% of the market. I imagine if, if the, 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 the numbers are true and, uh, that Facebook is 60%, then it's a whole 40% of people, I guess. 40, yeah. 40% of people. I, I mean, it's not a big, of the secret, market, yeah. especially, yeah, or yeah, sort of like, or sorry, of the number of headsets that are that's out right, there yeah. or whatnot. I think that's also one of those things where I believe that sort of like, I think that might be like the steam number in terms of like that with on steam, 60% oh, yes. of the users are Oculus Facebook. users. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't know, I don't know exact numbers. Um, I mean, the one other thing, and I mean, for better or worse, this is sort of something, but I've talked to tons of different devs and like, it's one of those things that like, yes, steam is still a market, but it is a 10th to a 20th, um, basically so so yeah it is a very hard and it's a very hard number to make it work for most indie devs um unless you're doing something very specific so i mean for better or worse it's one of those things that if you want to sort of make a business out of it targeting quest is still like that's the number one thing that any any responsible dev will tell on other indies is sort of like if you want to sort of make a successful or even just sort of like pay for itself VR game. Um, Quest is just sort of where everything's going right now. Uh, oh, I wanted to ask you, what's the huge, uh, I, the reason why I was asking you about Steam as well is not just so much on terms of getting more users to to yeah. uh, download your, your app, but also is it an opportunity to experiment on certain features that you can't get on, you know, you can't develop on the Quest? And if so, which which are those features? Um, you know, so we were already on Rift. So we already had sort of like the PC version of it. And we've turned up a couple of things and we've, you know, we sort of like all of the optimizations for Quest, we just basically turn off and let it run at full steam. Um, so we made the call because 
Quest is such a large, you know, it's it's such a massive part of our audience and our users that mm -hmm. we opted rather than trying to do like alternate versions of the courses or like upgrading assets or doing a ton of like special stuff. We'd rather do more courses because the, yes, it's true. You could do a much higher poly version of the course. You could do a lot of these different things, but then you're, you're kind of splitting the market or you're not splitting the market, but you're splitting the users and that some users are seeing one thing. Some users are seeing something totally different. Right. Um, and you have to model and develop everything twice. So we kind of opted sort of like, we're just going to stay with this, with this style. And as long as the physics and the gameplay are solid, um, mm -hmm. the other big factor for us is also the multiplayer stuff. Cause we had a lot of folks who were sort of like, Oh, I've got a quest. I've been playing it. I love it. My friend, Re I really want to play with my friend, but who won't buy it through Oculus for whatever reason. Right. So that right. was also kind of one of the other reasons that that particular, um, that those players were pretty vocal about that because there mm -hmm. was a lot of them wanting to play with their friends who are on Steam. Um, so, um, but yeah, but jumping back, we, we basically decided because we're wanting to keep making as many courses as we can reasonably do, um, mm -hmm. Part of that is that we just have to maintain style across all of the different platforms as opposed to, yeah, turning on or totally developing alternate versions of the courses just for PC. Which, yeah, which, uh, which, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, I would say in terms of consistency and yeah. branding and, and all that and experience, general experience, right? So they yeah. go from one headset to the other, at least um, they're still used to it and all that exactly. kind of stuff. I guess. Yeah. And it, it really does play like exactly the same. There's no fundamental difference. I mean, one of the, other than the optimizations, we also, because the game is so optimized for mobile, we're able to crank up the render scale quite high. So I, when, you, when you're when you playing on a PC, it is like you can't see pixels like at all because the render scale is just set so high. Right, um, right. Which is, it's, it's awesome. And it does make the game look very, very crisp and definitely sort of like it is a visual, a big visual step up when you're playing through PC. So, yeah. What's your, what's your, uh, at, at what what's your favorite course on the walkabout mini golf that you enjoy going back to again and again? <laughs> I think, I think seagull stacks hard gets a lot of, gets a lot of hate. I think that's probably one of my favorite ones, not just because I like that's the one, the snowy one. It's a very, very difficult course, but uh, yeah, I think I, I think that's probably my, my favorite one. It's just, yeah, seagulls, ocean but yeah like winter snow and everything coming down and, and it's a it, yeah like i said it's a very challenging course so that's probably my favorite and what are some of the other vr applications that inspire you or that you think of uh that, that yeah they inspire you as you're developing a uh, walkabout mm -hmm. mini golf um i'm sure we we play a lot i mean unfortunately we spend so much time in in vr developing that i don't get a chance to play as much as i like um I could say that, uh, I mean, we spend a lot of time in gravity sketch. So just creating in VR is super fun. I remember one of the games that stuck with me is the climb. Um, it, I love that. Actually, that probably has a lot of, it, in a similar way that you're sort of, it's halfway about exploring a really cool environment. You're just exploring it in a totally different way than we're doing with walkabout. Um, but yeah, that was another one that was one of my sort of first sort of wow moments in VR that's really stuck with me. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. Actually, a lot of the other sports games, there's just something about the replayability of mm -hmm. a lot of the sports games um, that is, it's just a really natural fit, especially for that more sort of like casual audience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the one other thing that's also, and part of this is just because of this, it's the nature of VR, um, but one of the things that I love about the space right now is as much as I love how pretty a lot of triple game, triple A games are and stuff, um, the big barrier for me and a lot of my friends in my age group, um, is that I've got two kids and I just don't have time like to sink 30, 40 hours into a game. Um, so something that delivers a really tight two to like, to me sort of like eight hours is about the max. Otherwise I just literally, won't have time to get through it. So I think that's one of the, the other really, really nice things about VR um, at the moment is there's just a lot more of those really tight but short experiences uh, right. coming out. So so for anyone who's learning how to code uh, or who's studying how to code and they're going to graduate or they're looking to get into the business, mm -hmm. um, what, 
you know, what are three key pieces of advice that you could give them uh, for them to even think about getting any shot into this business? Uh, I've got to do, well, we'll see if I get to three. Um, okay. the, <laughs> the first one that popped into my mind just when you said that is, uh, especially on the game side of thing, ship a game. You will learn so much more by shipping a game than you will by spending years and years developing something. So even if it's something small for mobile, for whatever, for the app lab, just like just anything you could do to just sort of like get something done and actually let people play it. Um, some of it is the coding side of things. Some, honestly, even like stri even if you have no interest in anything other than being a coder, there's a lot of stuff that will pop up once you're kind of like I've been, like we've been talking about a little bit of sort of like, oh, thinking about like, not only do you have to ship this game, but you also have to maintain it. And you're going to have to go back into that code every so often in order to just sort of like keep things running correctly or things like that, that it's just, it's a very, very helpful thing to have something out there. Um, it also, there's a lot of other reasons to do it, but, but yeah, for, for folks who are more on the technical side, if nothing else that there's, a, there's, it's well worth it to just get something shipped. Um, trying to think of other, other, uh, I'm blanking on a couple other ones because that was the first one that came up. Um, I'm going to stick with that one. It's sort of like that is all three. Ship, ship, ship. Um, and if I come up with another one before we, we end talking, I'll, I'll chime in. Well, how important is it to meet other developers or non-developers or just, uh, you know, getting yourself to be connected to, to other people, even if you don't get to work with them straight away, just joining Discord groups or any other form? Is that something that, you know, would be quite important to, to new people in, in this industry? I think that... It's good. I mean, if nothing else, it's great to have sort of a tribe um, and finding that tribe is something that, yeah, that I feel like um, a lot of people will naturally seek out. Um, so, yeah, I think, I mean, it's always good. I would also say that especially more on the learning to code side of things, it's also one of those things that that is a skill set that is much more driven by. So if you're thinking in terms of like some people think like, oh, networking, it's much less important on that side of things because it's really going to be your por portfolio that does it. Um, I guess maybe even one other thing that I would say is, um, and this is something that we deal with in the animation world a lot, mm -hmm. um, but uh, your degree matters zero. Um, so as much as I sort of like, if you learn better in that environment and you're able to learn things faster by being in a more traditional learning environment. That's great. But all that matters at the end of the day is what you can do and the projects that you have on your portfolio. Um, so yeah, even though I went to, I was actually a music major in college. Um, so I kind of came from a totally different side of things. And I did a lot of technical stuff, recording studio and a lot of audio things that have, have carried over and I still get to use a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but um but yeah, but basically that's, that's one thing that's sort of like, that's when we're, when I'm interviewing somebody or something like that, like that's, I might glance at that, but it really has zero bearing on, on um, the decision to hire someone or whether you're able to make a successful game or not. So, uh, so yeah, just, just know that as much as some of the, some people will try to push you towards that. Most people in the industry won't, won't care at all about that. And do you find that VR enables people who are a bit older, for example, in their 30s, 40s, or even 50s, or beyond that, uh, to want to change career and give it a crack, you know, give it a go to to explore how to 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 be into VR? Yeah, we have we've got a couple of folks um, either on the team or that we've just generally talked to who are kind of getting into it, who are kind of generally they're sort of coming over from an ancillary sort of thing, like they've been animators or designers or something like that. So they're, they're kind of in a related field and they're sort of like seeing VR for what the potential is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that maybe this is, this is not at all what you had asked, but one of the things that um, it might be worth it for some people to know is sort of like, I think that one of the big um, things that, design things that I kind of had in my mind was that because I'm used to mobile and I like things to be as simple as possible, we kind of, the game whole game was designed to be played with one controller and a single button. So mm -hmm. with just the trigger, you can play the entire game. 
But the way that I tested that was that I put my, my parents and a couple of other friends who are in their 60s, 70s um, into the headset and had them try it out. Mm -hmm. um, so especially in VR, getting a wide mix of people and especially folks who have never done VR before. Because um, if you can make it to the point that someone who has never picked up a VR headset can can put it on and be playing within 60 seconds, like that is a huge sort of like barrier that you have crossed off the list. Right. So, totally unrelated means, to what you, what you asked. No, no, it, I mean, it does, I guess, because in a sense it relates to your first answer, which was just design something, just release yeah. something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the same time, get it tested by people who have no clue. Uh, because if, uh, if people who don't understand it can get it, then you're probably on a winner, I would say, because those yeah. that get it will get even even more easily, right? I would imagine. Yeah. And back before lockdowns, we did a lot. And it wasn't, I, I realized that it wasn't necessarily for this reason, but we mm -hmm. did a lot of events where we'd have people, you know, hop in and play different stuff. And I always had a rule sort of like that, or just I found that sort of like, if you ever had to explain something for more than like 15 seconds, um, just attention spans would disappear. So like if you're ever doing demos and stuff, that is a really, really good way to just sort of detect, like if you can get your little spiel down and sort of like, hey, put this on, hold this, push this. If you can, anything you can do to sort of make that demo experience as smooth as possible. Um, some games are naturally, are not going to be like that. And if you're making something that's more hardcore or aimed at a hardcore audience, that's obviously going to be a, a different thing. But um, mm -hmm. there is a huge portion of the, of the audience, especially VR, who is not traditional gamers. So... No, I agree with that. I, I had a business here in Singapore before COVID called mm -hmm. a VR parties. Mm -hmm. And basically corporate companies would hire us to go out and give them VR entertainment during their own corporate events and what yeah. you know, or even go to their offices mm -hmm. uh, to do demos. And that was, you know, I, I had a couple of guys with me who were not in VR. They didn't even own a VR headset. Mm -hmm. And the only time they could be in VR was when we were together to go out to, mm -hmm. uh, to give demos to people. And it was, <laughs> we had to, specifically pick those VR experiences where you just really hit the nail there, which yeah. did not require us to have to explain to, to the, because sometimes we have 200 people, you know, mm -hmm. or 500 people and, and they all stuck up in their line and, and they all yeah. have like five minutes in VR and every five minutes you have to redo it again and again, and again, and explain yeah. again, and again. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, okay, we're going to pick these two because you just have to press this button yeah. and that button and that's it. So yeah. uh, I, I completely sympathize yeah. with and agree with, with I what mean, you just said. And that's also sort of like, again, I, I mentioned it before, but that's sort of why we went with mini golf. It's sort of like you didn't even have to explain, you don't even have to explain the goal to people. Like right. everyone knows what mini golf is. So like picking something that's like that, that is physical, that people just instantly grok. Like there is something very helpful and powerful about that. If you can, if you can make it work with the game that you want to make. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Lucas, for, uh, for today's call. Uh, I really appreciate it. And, um, yeah, I know it's just, it's been an eye opener and, or an ear opener, uh, to listen to, to what you had to say today. So thanks awesome. a lot. Yeah. Thank you for having me.